HP 4th Champion Part 6 Harry had been working and focusing all his energies on the coming task. So much so that he'd inadvertently isolated himself. Between classes, he had his nose stuck in the pages of Advanced Transfiguration, trying to memorize incantations for the task. He always sat at the end of the Hufflepuff or Gryffindor tables, as they were closest to the door. And eat as fast as he could so he could rush back to the library to catch up on his homework and look up more Transfiguration and Charm spells. Hermione Granger was often seen with him in the library, and more than a handful of rumors started that the two were seeing each other romantically. Hermione always told anyone who asked that she was only helping Harry do research and that he barely spoke to her while they worked. The only people other than Hermione that Harry spoke to at length were Neville and Cedric during their morning runs. Though Harry was only really half present during those times. As his mind kept creating images of giant fire-breathing dragons chasing him while the whole of Hogwarts laughed and pointed at a smoldering Harry Potter. Harry had been so deeply focused that he'd managed to actually upset a few people whom he'd ignored over the past week, which was brought to his attention the afternoon before the first task. Harry was walking towards the Great Hall for dinner, his eyes focused on his Transfiguration book as he examined a chapter on creating walls. Harry thought it a good idea to be able to conjure up stone walls to hide behind when the dragon decided to roast him alive. Harry. I can't use a wooden wall, that's stupid. I may as well just tie myself to a spit and let the dragon rotisserie me. Harry thought. Harry. I need brick or stone. But the main thing is to make a place so I can hit the damned thing. Harry. What? Harry looked up in exasperation, nearly dropping his book as he turned to face whomever was calling him. Tracy Davis was standing there looking very angry. Daphne Greengrass was standing behind her looking very apologetic. Tracy, you're being ridiculous. Daphne hissed. Two weeks, Potter. Two weeks. Tracy snapped, her eyes narrowed as she pointed her finger at Harry. I know that you're a boy, and as such can be a little on the slow side, but two weeks. I, uh, I. Harry stammered looking to Daphne for some sort of clue. Unfortunately, the blonde could only shake her head. Did I do something wrong? Tracy asked her eyes pleading. I mean, I thought we had a good time together. But then, you stopped talking to me. I did. Harry looked surprised. I didn't mean to. I just got really busy but not too busy to flirt with every other pair of breasts in the school. Tracy said accusingly. I even heard that you snogged Luna Lovegood again. Harry couldn't help but smile. Luna had once again cornered him last Friday. He had been on his way to his room to work on his homework before dinner, when Luna had stepped out of an alcove in his path. Hello, Harry Potter. She had smiled in her dreamy sort of way. Hi, Luna. Harry said looking up from his book, starting to pass her by. Luna immediately stepped in his way. Harry bumped into her and apologized quickly. My apologies, Harry, but it's been pointed out to me on several occasions that when I kissed you I may have done it wrong. Uh, I don't think that's true. Harry smiled remembering how she had lunged at him and locked her sweet, soft lips with his. That's very nice of you. Luna said, cocking her head to the side, a the barest hint of a smile on her face. And then, just like before, she lunged at him, her arms wrapping around his neck and her lips connecting with his. Harry felt his hands go limp, his books falling to the floor as he clutched her waist. This time, Luna's lips massaged Harry's gently, and after a few seconds, her tongue sought entrance. Harry wrapped his arms around Luna's waist. The kiss lasted a very long time, and Harry began to really enjoy Luna's hands in his hair. And then, 
Just as quickly as it began, the kiss ended, leaving Harry a bit breathless. So? He asked expectantly. Luna looked at him thoughtfully for a few moments before shrugging. Very nice, but still. I don't know what the big deal is about. Maybe we should try it with no clothes on, like Sully said. Harry felt his face burn and he quickly bent to pick up his books. Luna, I think you did it perfectly. Maybe you're just not attracted to me in that way. Maybe that's why you're not feeling anything. Luna thought about that for a few moments before slowly nodding. I suppose that's a possibility. She said after a few minutes. It could also be that I'm suffering from rack spurts. Goodbye. Harry watched her go, amusement on his face. It was clear that he was never going to get used to Luna, and he only hoped that if he did get a girlfriend, she would not ambush kiss him like that. It could make things very difficult for him. Harry realized too late that his smiling over the memory was the wrong thing to do. Tracy's eyes narrowed at once and she stepped closer. So, it's true. You kissed that freaky little wench. Tracy snarled, which made Harry take a step back from her, his eyes widening in fear. Um actually she kissed me. But, what difference does it make? Harry asked, still confused. What difference? Oh, boy. Daphne heaved a sigh, her hand going to her forehead. I'll tell you the difference. I have been waiting very patiently for you to ask me out, or at least ask me out on another date. But you've completely ignored me for the last two weeks. Harry asked unhelpfully. Tracy's eyes narrowed more dangerously. Am I not good enough for you? Is that it? Do you only go after girls who surprise you in the halls and snog your brains out? Could you just calm down and explain to me exactly what it is you're talking about? U.S. You and me. Tracy shrieked. Are you just some jerk who dates a girl and dumps her because you didn't get to second base or whatever bizarre metaphor you Neanderthals use? Harry looked over Tracy's shoulder to see Daphne still shaking her head in exasperation. He turned back to Tracy, who had all but closed the gap between them. What is it that's going to open your eyes? Tracy snapped. She suddenly grabbed the front of Harry's robes and kissed him very hard. She held him for a long, tense moment and released him, huffing. There. Maybe that got through that thick head of yours. With that, she brushed past him and went into the great hall leaving him even more confused than he had been when she'd initially started yelling at him. Daphne stepped a bit closer to Harry, who was watching the auburn-haired girl stomp into dinner. Just so I'm clear here. Harry said not looking at Daphne, who had her arms folded over her chest. She's been waiting for you to ask her out, yeah. You haven't talked to her since your date, and she's been getting herself all riled up, thinking you just wanted to use her or something. I didn't. Harry began, turning to Daphne, who shrugged. I tried to tell her that. Any boy who wanted to just use her wouldn't have tried to fix the date that got screwed up by someone else, or hex the person who had actually caused the date to go wrong in the first place. I also pointed out that you've barely talked to anyone this past week. Does she know that she could have come talk to me at any time? Harry asked, starting for the great hall with Daphne in tow. Don't think I didn't tell her that. She's proud. And extremely stubborn. Daphne stopped Harry, grabbing his arm. She's my best friend, and I don't want her to get hurt. So, if you're just stringing her along. Stringing her. Harry looked dubiously at Daphne. He sighed and let his shoulders fall a bit. Look. I didn't realize that she took the date so seriously. I thought we were just having a nice time getting to know one another. I think she was fine with the date. 
Daphne said flatly. It was the fact that you stood up for her with Pansy. That meant a lot to her. I would do that for any of my friends. Harry said emphatically and Daphne smiled a soft smile. And besides, I'm only going to be here for the tournament. How could she, or any other girl, want to start a relationship that's doomed to begin with? Because it's better to have loved and lost and all that. Daphne shrugged then she looked pointedly at Harry, who was watching Tracy spoon roast potatoes on her plate. Harry, just keep in mind that a lot of girls who you talk to or spend time with might be thinking the same as Tracy. You're going to end up breaking a lot of hearts, Harry. Try and keep it in mind in the future. Daphne turned and went off to the Slytherin table, leaving Harry completely flummoxed. Harry. Hermione grabbed his shoulder. Are you all right? Yeah. Harry said, then shook his head. No I don't know. Hermione, do you want to date me? What? Hermione asked, looking stunned. Are you asking me out? What? No. Harry shook his head, then felt really bad at the sight of Hermione's expression. He took a deep breath and attempted to center himself before he tried again. No, that's not what I meant. Harry said apologetically. I just... Tracy just yelled at me because I haven't asked her out again, or to be my girlfriend. I didn't even know she liked me that way. I just thought we had a nice time together, and then... Harry made an expanding gesture with his hands while making an explosion sound. Oh. Hermione's smile returned. I thought you weren't sure how you felt about her. I'm still not, but according to Daphne, she's been waiting for me to ask her out. She's also mad that I haven't talked to her since we went out last time. Does she know that she could have talked to you? Hermione looked puzzled. That's what I said. Harry replied shrugging. The more I learn about girls, the less I actually know. We are a highly complex and ever-changing creature. Hermione smiled superiorly. She headed towards the Grafender table where Ginny and Neville were already eating and talking. Hermione sat down and Ginny passed her a platter of pork chops. You know, this wasn't a problem at Salem. Harry grimaced. I was never this popular, and I was always pursuing the girls. Or rather, one girl. You had a girlfriend? Ginny asked. Harry only now noticed that the redhead was sitting next to Hermione, and she was looking very interested. Harry wasn't really sure how he felt about Ginny. She was nice, there was no doubt but she always looked at him like a lost puppy. It was rather annoying. No. Harry shook his head. I thought I was close, though. I've been friends with Stacy for like a year, and right before my life got turned all upside down, I was trying to get up the courage to ask her to be my girlfriend. Everything felt simpler then. I don't know what you're complaining about. Ginny said. Just about every boy in this school would give their arm to be so sought after by the female population. I guess. Harry shrugged. But, what does it matter if you end up hurting people's feelings and they all end up hating you in the end? Ginny and Hermione sat back, neither of them knew what to say to that. Harry grabbed a couple of dinner rolls and got up. I'll see you guys later. Once again. He ends up making me think. Ginny said. It never occurred to me that by picking one girl to be with, he'd end up ruining the friendships he's been cultivating. Well, only the people who weren't truly his friends to begin with. Hermione said sadly. Tracy should have at least waited until after the first task. I'd be willing to bet he ends up wasting time trying to figure out what to do about the Tracy situation when he needs to keep focused on tomorrow. You're worried about him, aren't you? Ginny sighed. 
Hermione simply nodded, and Ginny grabbed her friend's hand and gave a reassuring squeeze. Me, too. The morning of the first task dawned with an overcast sky and a thick frost on the ground. Harry, Cedric, and Neville had all agreed to skip their workout that morning, so Harry had a bit of a lie-in, though he had barely slept the night before. At eight o'clock the previous night, Professor Dumbledore had come to his quarters to give Harry his uniform for the task, which consisted of something similar to running pants. A pair of boots that were very similar to his sneakers and a jersey with the Salem Academy crest on the front and his name on the back. He had also received a letter from his headmistress, which said that she and the rest of the school was firmly behind him and wished him the very best of luck. Harry wished that Mark and Stacy and a few of his other friends could be there, but Dumbledore had said it would be a bit difficult to get them here to Hogwarts by the time the task started but that they would work on it for the next task. Harry was excused from classes for the day, which he was quite thankful for, as he knew he'd be unable to concentrate with the task looming over him throughout the day. He decided to linger in his room at least until classes started, then he headed to the kitchens for a light breakfast. When he finished his meal, Harry returned to his room, where he started another letter to Mark. He got as far as addressing the letter when he realized he had nothing new to tell his best friend, having written him just a few days ago. Harry was sure that Mark would enjoy the pictures, especially since they were mostly of the girls. Little Colin Creevy had proven to be most willing to take pictures, and had developed them and returned them to Harry, even going out of his way to create doubles. So Harry could keep some for himself. Harry spent most of the day going over his plans in his head. He tried to imagine every kind of scenario that involved a dragon, and how he might handle it. He felt unprepared, despite having what he considered to be a solid plan. At nearly five in the afternoon, there came a knock on his door. Harry rushed to the door and felt a wave of relief when he saw Sirius and Remus standing there beaming at him. How are you feeling, kiddo? Sirius asked, embracing Harry firmly. Nervous. Harry answered honestly. I just want to get it over with. Understandable. Remus said, also embracing Harry warmly. But, you told us your plan last weekend, and like we told you then, it's good. Thanks. Harry said taking a seat on the couch before the fire. Remus and Sirius following, taking up the empty chairs. But, I'm still nervous. It's okay. Sirius said. Actually, I'd be more worried if you weren't nervous. The key is to keep your focus. Tune out the crowds and concentrate on what you need to do here tonight. Harry nodded. And his godfather and Remus turned the conversation away from the coming task. An hour later, a house elf arrived with platters of food for them, much to Harry's surprise, until Sirius explained that he and Remus had spoken to Dumbledore before they'd come to his room. And that the headmaster had promised to make sure they had a private dinner. Harry didn't eat much, being far too nervous, though Sirius and Remus did try to get him to eat more. Finally, at a quarter to seven, Professor McGonagall arrived to escort Harry down to the grounds where the first task was to take place. Harry, flanked by Sirius and Remus, followed the deputy headmistress down to a large tent. He got firm hugs from both men, who were told they could not enter the tent, and Harry entered to find the three other champions, all wearing similar uniforms to his own. Each emblazoned with their school crests and their own names on the back. Hi, Harry. Cedric gave a nervous nod to Harry, who returned the gesture. Harry found the tent had a large open space, as well as four small rooms, each with a cot set up. Harry went and sat down on one and watched the three others. The French girl, Fleur, simply sat on a cot, her legs crossed primly, one arm laying across her knees. She was nervously chewing on the nails of her other hand as she stared blankly at a spot on the ground. 
Victor, the Derm Strand champion, paced back and forth, rolling his shoulders and twisting his waist and moving his head, loosening himself up, Harry guessed. Occasionally, Victor would glance at Harry, nodding at him when Harry would try and smile at him. Cedric looked as nauseous as Harry felt. The tall blonde boy kept standing and then sitting after a quick pace about the tent. They could hear the noise of the crowd awaiting the beginning of the tournament. The tent flap was flung open, and the champions all turned to look as Rita Skeeter and her photographer entered. Well, now. She smiled her simpering smile that Harry felt didn't quite reach her eyes. Here we are, moments away from what promises to be a very dangerous and exciting event. Hundreds of people prepared to chant your names and scream with ecstasy when you are victorious, or weep over your corpses. What must you all be feeling? Now, Rita. Ludo Bagman said entering the tent followed by Dumbledore, Karkaroff, and Madame Maxime. Once again Harry felt a pang of jealousy that his own headmistress wasn't there. He would have liked it if she were there to stand beside him like the other champions. Miss Skeeter, I'm sure you know that the champion's tent is off limits to the press. Dumbledore said pointedly. Indeed. Rita smiled and swept out without another word, though she winked at the champions. Harry thought her gaze had lingered on him a few moments longer than the others. Once the annoying reporter was gone, Ludo Bagman gathered the champions around him, holding out a large sack in front of him. Inside this bag is a model of what you are about to face, attached with a number which will dictate the order in which you will go. Your task is simply to get the golden egg by any means you can. Now, ladies first. Ludo held out the bag to Fleur, who looked nervously at her headmistress before reaching into the bag and pulling out the model of the dragon. Which turned to look at her scathingly as she opened her hand. It had a tag with the number two around its neck. The Welsh Green. Bagman nodded approvingly as he held the bag out to Crumb, who stuck his hand in the bag and pulled out his own model dragon, a number three around its neck. The Chinese Fireball. Bagman smiled offering the bag to Cedric, who took a great breath and fished in the bag drawing out a rather sleepy looking model dragon with the number one. Swedish Short Snout, very nice. Bagman said turning to Harry Potter. Which leaves? Harry stuck his hand into the bag and gripped the tiny animated model of the dragon he would face. He opened his hand and stared at the tiny dragon, which shook itself out and stretched its tiny wings before turning to Harry and eyeing him coldly. The Hungarian Horntail. Now, when the gong sounds, Mr. Diggory, just head out that way and when you have completed your task, you'll exit the other side of the arena. Then Miss Delacour, Mr. Crumb, and finally, Mr. Potter. You will get your scores right after while the arena is being set up for the next champion. That's it, and good luck. Remember, the sound of the gong. Bagman left, with the heads of each school following. Harry went back to his cot and stared at the tiny horn tail in his hand, looking it over carefully. As it was supposed to be an exact model, Harry felt it wise to get a good look at it so he had some clue what he was about to face. The tiny dragon in his hand was a deep black with sinister gold eyes and loads of bronze-colored spike along its spine and tail, which Harry felt would be just as dangerous as its front end. Harry wondered what its temperament would be like, as he knew that a few species were rather friendlier than others, though somehow, as he stared at the model, which was watching him in return. Was likely not to be one of the nice dragons. A gong sounded, and Harry looked up as Cedric rose from his own cot, pulled his jersey down, pulled his wand from his wrist holster, and without a glance back, march out of the tent. For a moment, Harry thought about going to the entrance and seeing if he could watch, but he wasn't sure if it was allowed. That, and his legs felt shaky and he wasn't sure if he would be able to stand. Ludo Bagman's voice came to them from somewhere outside the tent. He was commentating on the task, 
though it was very bad. Harry and the others had no clue what was happening, though they heard the occasional angry roar of a dragon. The commentary was punctuated by light applause and cheers, until, after 15 minutes, the crowds erupted in very loud cheers and Bagman shouted, He's done it. He's done it. Harry felt a bit of relief. Cedric had made it past his dragon. Harry hoped that Cedric received good marks for his performance and that he would be in the lead by the time this was over. He really wanted Cedric to win, though Harry was a bit biased as he thought of Cedric as a friend. After 10 minutes, and Bagman announcing that Cedric's score was being posted, though he didn't announce them, the gong sounded again and this time Fleur rose to her feet. Harry found it amazing that, as she sat waiting, she had looked so nervous and fidgety. Yet, when the gong sounded, and the French champion rose, her anxiety seemed to melt off and she looked as if she were made of stone. Just as had happened with Cedric, Harry heard Bagman commentating on Fleur's performance. This time however, the crowd was strangely silent, though Harry heard a few whistles. Even more surprising was the lack of noise from the dragon. It seemed to drag on and on, and Harry found himself gazing at his watch. Finally after nearly 25 minutes, the crowds erupted in cheers, and Bagman was heard saying, I doubt our other champions will use such a unique way of dealing with their dragon. No doubt about that. On the next gong, Victor Crumb took a deep breath and turned to Harry. Good luck to you. Victor said in a low rumbling voice, before he exited the tent. Leaving Harry alone to listen to the raucous cheers of the crowd as the world famous Quidditch player took to the arena. The roars of the crowds were nothing compared to those of the dragon. Bagman seemed quite worried that Crumb was going to get himself killed. But then, after 15 minutes, the cheers of the crowds and Bagman's exclamations of well done, told Harry that Crumb was now through. Harry rose from his cot and shook himself out, hoping some of his anxiety would fall away. However, when he bent over to touch his toes, Harry felt like he was going to throw up. Taking several calming breaths, Harry stepped towards the tent's entrance and pulled his wand from his wand holster and closed his eyes. Trying to center himself as he often did when trying to master a difficult spell. That's all this was. Mastering a very difficult spell. The gong sounded and Harry opened his eyes. His heart pounded in his chest as he reached through the tent flaps and exited the safety of the champion's tent. Harry found himself in a small arena-like setting that was covered in sharp, craggy rocks. Harry turned and saw the stadium-like seating filled with students and spectators, all watching him in silence. Harry couldn't see the dragon, as the tent opened into a small pit. Harry needed to climb a small hill before he saw the dragon, who was apparently waiting for him. Harry barely made it behind a large boulder when the Hungarian horntail let loose a torrent of fiery breath that heated the boulder Harry was hiding behind to near Molten. Harry's arms got burned from leaning against the stone. Harry chanced to glance around a glowing stone and caught sight of a clutch of granite-colored eggs that the horntail was standing over protectively. In the center, Harry spied a hint of gold. The horntail stretched out its neck and roared angrily at Harry, its gold eyes watching him very closely. Harry knew what he had to do now. Giving the incantation, Harry pointed his wand around a boulder at some of the broken rocks on the ground. Harry's confidence fell when he saw the long, thin chain that looked like it was only good for decoration. Harry had to move as the dragon let loose another blast of flame. The stone he'd originally hidden behind was still very hot, and Harry didn't like the idea of being cooked on it. While the dragon was still attempting to melt the boulder Harry had been behind, Harry came round his new shelter and tried the incantation again, focusing harder to get the results he needed. Harry felt a rush of glee as a thick chain was formed from the broken stones near him. Harry levitated the chain up so it would wrap around the dragon and Harry could pull it away from the nest it was so protectively guarding. 
The chain flew at the beast, which opened its mouth and caught the chain, shaking its head angrily, trying to kill the chain, which it saw as another threat. To Harry's great horror, the dragon managed to break the chain with its claws and teeth. Okay. I need something stronger. Harry said to himself. Moving fast as the dragon turned its great head, roaring as it rearranged itself between Harry and the nest. It raked its great front claws on the ground, leaving long tears in the stone. It began moving its head back and forth watching the boulder Harry was now trapped behind, waiting for the intruder to show itself again. Harry's heart was pounding in his chest now. Harry closed his eyes and took three deep breaths. Clutching his wand, he aimed it at the ground and very softly yet firmly spoke the spell one more time. At once the mess of broken stones at his feet linked, expanded, and formed a very heavy, long iron chain. Harry grinned and got to his feet, and began to guide the new chains to fling around the dragon's neck, and begin to pull it away from the nest. The dragon reacted exactly as Harry had expected, and began roaring and clawing hard at the ground, trying to turn towards Harry. Who had become a bit braver now that the dragon was being drugged away and was coming out from behind his hiding place. Unfortunately, in all his satisfaction at getting the spell just right, Harry forgot about the dragon's tail. The horn tail twisted and its long, spiked tail came crashing down, just grazing his shoulder, tearing his jersey and opening a long gash along his arm. Harry's concentration wavered, and the dragon broke loose from the heavy iron chain that had managed to drag it away a few feet from its nest. The horn tail turned and opened its mouth, a burst of fire issuing forth, singeing Harry as he ducked out of the way and scrambled behind the largest boulder. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Harry thought, lightly touching his arm which stung badly. The dragon roared angrily and Harry felt the ground shake as it moved back to the nest. Harry knew he couldn't sit here forever and got to his feet again. Flicking his wand at the heavy chains he'd conjured and watched from behind the safety of the boulder as he directed it to wrap around the dragon's neck again. This time making it pull the dragon down to the ground. The horn tail shrieked and its tail whipped around to flatten Harry. The teen was ready for this, though and with another flick of his wand, the end of the chain not currently holding the dragon's neck shot up and wrapped itself around the tail. Also pulling it to the ground. Harry struggled to keep the dragon in check as the beast fought against the chains he was trying to subdue it with. Harry had never done anything so difficult, and found himself tiring with the effort. Harry wanted to transfigure more chains, but wasn't sure it would be wise to do so, as he thought the dragon would break free while he made a new chain. The beast stamped and clawed, trying to get out of the thick heavy chains, twisting its head trying to get a clear shot at Harry. Wanting nothing more than to burn him alive for daring to get near its young. Come on, you big bitch. Harry said to himself, still struggling to make the chains hold the dragon down. Stay down, please. Harry was sweating hard now, and he felt like he'd sprinted around the quid-ditch pitch a thousand times. He'd never exerted himself this much in his life. Harry prayed that the dragon would just give up and let him take the damned egg so he could just go back to the castle and call it a day. As if answering his prayers, the horn tail suddenly rolled over, its struggles lessening up. Harry nearly fell over as the pull on his magic slackened. He thought the horn tail had just given up and Harry was about to shout out, but in the next moment, he realized what the beast had done. It was exactly like he'd seen some nasty people do before in a game of tug of war. They had waited until the other team was pulling its hardest and then, they just let go, making the opposing team fall backward. The dragon had just done the animal equivalent, and when Harry's magic slackened, the dragon rolled back onto its feet and turned towards Harry. Who had been inching his way towards the nest all during their struggle. Harry didn't pause or turn to run. He pointed his wand at the ground and changed a mess of rocks into long, 
thick steel bars that rose up and drove themselves into the ground. Stopping the dragon from charging. More and more stones were altered and quickly followed their fellows, driving themselves into the ground, encircling the horn tail. The beast was displeased and roared loudly, smashing its head into the first bars. And then, eyeing Harry angrily, spread its wings. Harry was breathing hard now as he once again used his wand to grab a hold of the chain still wrapped around the dragon's neck, and transfiguring a few more stones. Drove the new steel bars through the links of the chain, nailing it into the ground, keeping the dragon down. Having only one weapon left to it, the horn tail began spitting long pillars of flame at Harry, who chose not to wait around. Harry darted towards the nest and snatched up the heavy golden egg and sprinted over the uneven ground. His foot slipped and he crashed to his knees, tearing open the legs of his pants and cutting up his knees pretty good. Harry got his feet under him again as he heard the gut-wrenching shriek of teeth and claws on steel as the furious dragon tore at the metal spikes keeping it away from its nest. Harry ran through the exit, slamming hard into someone, who staggered back, but clutched Harry's arms to keep him from falling. Harry looked up and saw a look of sheer amazement on the face of Victor Crumb. I got it. Harry said stupidly as the Hogwarts matron came rushing up to him and began to check him over. Well done. Crumb said in his deep rumbling voice. He still had Harry by the arms, and it was a good thing, as Harry was swaying on his feet. Help me to get him to one of the beds. The nurse said worriedly. Harry felt his head swimming, and a chill that started in his spine and surged up to his brain. Harry. Sirius shouted and Harry turned to look for his godfather, but everything was becoming dark, and Harry felt his body falling. A deep fathomless blackness embraced him a second later as Harry passed out. The voices were distant at first. He couldn't understand them. There were many. Though at times there was only two. He could also see a faint light in the distance. It was rather inviting and he thought he'd like to see it up close. It turned out that the light and the voices were connected somehow. The closer he got to the light, the clearer the voices became, until he could actually make out what the voices were saying. I wish he'd just wake up. A girl said. She sounded very familiar, though he couldn't identify the owner. I'd feel so much better if he woke up. Then at least I'd know he was okay. Well, you heard Madame Pomfret and the others. He exhausted himself. He was using some really advanced techniques. I'm still amazed by it all. Another voice said. Another girl. Ladies. A third female called, much older sounding. It is now dinner time. Off you go. You may return afterwards. Dinner. Food sounded really good to him. He'd really like a hamburger. A huge, juicy burger with cheese and bacon and everything on it. And fries. A whole mess of fries. Wow that sounded amazing. Yeah, he was going to get a hamburger and fries. And a milkshake. How long had it been since he had a huge chocolate milkshake? Can you believe that? Another voice asked. A male. Very familiar. In fact, he knew at once that it was serious. He's got nearly every girl in the school checking in on him. Shame he's been asleep for it all. Yes, but those five have come every day, and stayed for hours. Those five are very devoted to him. I wouldn't be surprised if one of them became his girlfriend before the end. Remus. Remus was here as well. Sirius and Remus were here, and there were five girls who kept coming in to see him, and by the gods, he really wanted that hamburger. The light became very clear and his eyes actually stung from it. Burger. Harry mumbled. Harry. Sirius said, and Harry felt a weight settle on the bed next to him. 
Merlin, you gave us quite a turn there, lad. How are you feeling? Hungry. Harry said sounding much more awake now. Move aside. Madame Pomfrey, a rather fussy looking witch said, pushing Sirius off Harry's bed. Harry tried to sit up, but the witch, who looked like she'd fall over if a good stiff breeze came along, showed a surprising amount of strength and held him down. You magically exhausted yourself, Mr. Potter. You've been asleep for nearly three days now. Three days? Harry asked, looking imploringly at Sirius and Remus who both wore identical looks of relief. You really overexerted yourself out there, kid. Using your magic to subdue that dragon with magical chains. Incredible, but foolish. You should have just used the conjunctivitis curse we told you about. Sirius said. Still, you did put on one hell of a show. You took second place. Even Karkaroff gave you high marks. That's saying something, as he scored both Fleur and Cedric low. Remus remarked. Dumbledore was really impressed, as was the majority of the spectators. You've had a parade of visitors every day since the task. Sirius said as Madame Pomfrey stepped away. You'll need plenty of rest, and food, but I think you should be able to leave tomorrow evening. I wish to keep you here one more night and make sure you don't exert yourself. Pomfrey said sternly, before turning her back and walking away from the three men. The only thing I want to exert is my mouth. I need a big cheeseburger with bacon and everything on it, fries and the biggest chocolate milkshake you can get me. In fact, make it too. Harry said looking to his godfather. Sirius threw his head back and roared with laughter, while Remus chuckled along. Half an hour later, Harry wrapped his hands around the biggest burger he'd ever laid eyes on and moaned in glorious satisfaction as he took his first bite. Sirius had gone to the kitchens and made a special request of the house elves. Though he didn't get two milkshakes, Harry was quite satisfied with the one Sirius showed up with. Sirius remarked that it would have been small to Hagrid. As he ate, Remus and Sirius told Harry about all that had happened after the task had finished. His godfather had thought he'd seen the first signs of Harry exhaustion when he began transfiguring the giant steel poles which kept the dragon back. Remus had known it before then, but had hoped he was wrong, as he'd never seen Harry cast anything before. He'd received perfect marks from Dumbledore, Madame Makes, and Bartimius Crouch, while Igor Karkaroff gave him a seven. Sirius commented that the Durmstrang headmaster had scored Cedric and Fleur at three, while his own student had gotten a perfect ten. They then told Harry of the many students who'd come to look in on him. One of the girls kept apologizing. If I heard her correctly, she thinks that she's at fault for you being here. Something about yelling at you the day before the task. Sirius quirked an eyebrow as Harry took along. Fulfilling slurp from the bucket containing the very tastiest milkshake he'd ever had in his life. I'm going to guess that was Tracy. Harry said, letting out a very obnoxious belch. She was mad because I hadn't asked her out again, or really talked to her. I just got so busy with the task that I kind of ignored a lot of people. Well, I'd try to do better this time. Sirius said folding his arms and leaning back in his seat. Speaking of which, Remus said. He nodded at the golden egg on Harry's bedside table. The clue for the next task is in that. It's going to happen early in the morning on February the 24th. I'd suggest you begin working on it as soon as possible. Harry nodded and, as he finished his meal, listened as Sirius and Remus told him about what the other champions had done to get past their own dragons. Harry made a mental note to open the egg and start working out exactly what he was going to do so that he could spend the next two months getting ready. Despite the roaring fire, he felt cold, and couldn't stop shivering. He desperately wished he could move himself closer to the fire at least, 
but he was most unfortunately dependent of his servant, who was off somewhere, most likely defiling the Horkins woman. Ever since he'd destroyed her mind, his servant had spent nearly every night with her, the disgusting pervert. Still, for now, he would allow it. So long as he continued to serve him correctly, he would not allow his serpent to feast upon the ministry which... Suddenly the fire flared up and the flames turned green. Wormtail. He called out. He heard the fat weakling running from somewhere below, his feet sounding heavy on the steps as he approached. Master. Wormtail called as he entered the room, bowing low and averting his eyes as he came around a large chair. My loyal servant calls. Bring me closer to the fire so I may hear his report. Wormtail gave a jealous look over his shoulder, noticing that the flames were now green. He quickly moved behind the chair and began sliding it forward towards the fire. Careful Wormtail. I will be most displeased if you cause me to fall. His voice was cold and threatening. He looked into the green flames and saw the face of his loyal agent looking very pleased. He bowed his head. My lord. The first task is finished. It was over three days ago. He snapped angrily. Why has it taken you so long to make your report? I beg your forgiveness, my lord. I feared our plan had failed. The boy exhausted himself during the task. I feared he'd killed himself, but I have just gotten word that the boy is well. He is in second place now. He listened to the report and thought very carefully about what he'd just heard. It wasn't the boy's power he wanted, but it was worth taking note of. After all, the boy was supposedly destined to be his end. He knew there was only one place to get his answer for the question that constantly repeated itself in his mind. Continue to monitor the situation, and report to me should anything change. Do not harm the boy or draw attention to yourself. As you wish, my lord. The servant bowed his head and withdrew from the flames. At once the green changed back to the warm orange and yellow fire it had been before. My lord, may I speak? You may wormtail. He said, breathing deeply as the fire warmed him now that he was much closer to the fire. Please do not misunderstand me, your plan is a good one. My only concern is that you must wait so long. Surely if we found another suitable wizard, you could return to your full strength much sooner. It seems a waste of time for you to remain here as you are, suffering in this form. You would have me select any wizard? Any wizard would do, according to your thinking. He asked, loving how Wormtail cowered under his glare. Surely we could find a powerful wizard suitable to your needs. It is true that I could select a powerful wizard and fashion a new body for myself. But I need the boy. For reason far too complex for your simple mind to comprehend, the boy must be the one. I only suffer because of your incompetence. Now, it is time for my feeding. You will milk Nogany at once. No go. Wormtail bowed and left his master to his thoughts. He was now one step closer to reaching his goal. He would be resurrected and he would destroy the boy, solidifying his power once and for all. Then, he would finish what he'd started thirteen years ago. Very soon the world would tremble once again at the name of Lord Voldemort. I'm telling you, not once. Sirius threw his hands up in frustration. Never in his entire fourteen years has he ever complained of his scar hurting this badly. Yes, once or twice over the last three years he's mentioned a bit of a sting, but nothing like what he suffered last night. I mean, for Merlin's sake, the thing almost looked as if it had just been made. Sirius and Remus were in the headmaster's office the day after Harry had finally awoken. They had come to see the headmaster about an hour before Harry was to be released. 
confident that Harry was fully recovered and would be well taken care of if the mischievous smile on the auburn-haired girl's face was any clue, Sirius and Remus bade Harry goodbye, promising that they would see him in the coming weekend. Once they had gained audience with Dumbledore, they explained how Harry had awoken during the night trembling badly and complaining about the severe pain in his scar as well as blabbering about having seen Wormtail tending to his master. Dumbledore nodded, his left hand stroking his beard idly as he thought over all he'd just heard. It is most disconcerting that his scar bothered him so powerfully as well as the dream that accompanied it the old headmaster said reflectively. I confess that I am truly bewildered by it. That his scar painting him should also accompany what seems a vision as opposed to a dream. I just wish he could have told us where it happened. Remus said sullenly. Wormtail and Voldemort in one place. It would have been most helpful. While Voldemort is still in this weakened state, capturing him would prove most effortless. Dumbledore looked wistful. How is it that Voldemort has returned in the first place? Sirius asked, sitting in a chair once again. I know that you said that day I took Harry that he might one day return, but how is it possible? I have a theory though I am not 100% positive about it. I have spent every spare moment I could looking into my hypothesis. It has been enlightening, but unfortunately, I have nothing conclusive. You're not going to tell us, are you? Remus gave a chagrin smiled and Dumbledore's mouth twitched mirthfully. At this time, I do not think it a good idea. I think, for the moment, our focus should remain on getting Harry though this tournament. Once we've accomplished that, we shall all gather for a very long discussion. My sincerest hope is that it will be mostly historical in nature. Dumbledore tried to smile, but both men noticed that there was no twinkle in his eye. You don't think it will be, do you? Sirius said, sounding very dejected. No I don't. And given the state of a few individuals, this troubles me more than it would have a few months ago. Dumbledore sighed. You're talking about Snape. Remus leaned forward. Dumbledore's eyebrows rose questioningly but he nodded. Harry told us about what happened. He should have gone to Azkaban. Sirius grimaced. I don't understand how you could have protected that bastard all these years. Have you forgotten that it was he who warned us of Lord Voldemort's interest in Harry? No. Sirius shook his head. He lifted his head to look at Dumbledore sternly. But one good deed does not correct a lifetime of wrongs, does it? It was not a lifetime. Dumbledore said kindly. You could have very easily been in his position, save for one or two differences, Sirius. Unlike Severus, you had good friends who inspired you to be the very best person you could be. Severus had one, whom he foolishly drove away, thanks in large part to his immature jealousy as well as his naivete in listening to his fellow Slytherins. Who all felt that Lord Voldemort was the second coming of Salazar Slytherin himself. I will not deny that he tortured and murdered, nor I think would he. However, he started on the road to redemption the day he came to me, begging that I protect James and Lily. But he still served that blighter. Sirius started to argue. Do you remember when we started really countering Voldemort? All the lives we were able to save near the end of the war? Do you have any idea how I knew of all the attacks in advance? It was Severus. He turned spy for our side, and it was because of him that the both of you are alive, as well as Amelia Bones, Moody, Augusta Longbottom, the Green Grasses, the entire Bobbin. Radford and Everard lines, not to mention the countless Muggles and Muggleborns. Severus has repaid his debt. So why'd he attack Harry? Sirius countered, looking unconvinced. Harry. I believe represents the very best and worst things in Severus' life. He is nearly a mirror image of James Potter, 
and for Severus it must be a horrible reminder of his time as a student here at Hogwarts, but I think it is Harry's eyes that hurt Severus the most. Imagine if you can looking into Harry's eyes and being reminded over and over again how you pushed away your only true friend. A friend that you love with all your being. I can think of no worse punishment. But the way he treats the students. Remus tried. My gods, Dumbledore. Despite what many people believe of me, I have always been aware of how Severus treats those in his care. It seems every year I had to remind him that he was supposed to be a teacher. It was my deepest hope that he would just let go of the hate he clings to, and turn into the man I know lives deep within him. But I'm afraid the hatred he held for you two and James turned inward and has poisoned him. His assault of a student forced me to serve him notice. He is now on probation, and has until the end of the year to make a change, or he will be released from service. You're firing him. Sirius looked surprised. It is not my desire to do so. Severus, for all his faults, would be ideally suited to step back into his role as spy for our side, should the need arise. I fear what may become of him if he is let go. He would not survive very long. Those still loyal to Voldemort would try to kill him. He's been serving this school, and to their minds, me for the last thirteen years. A greater betrayal they would not be able to think of. Then there are the many former students he's taught. Dumbledore shook his head sadly and leaned back further in his chair, looking at both men in turn. I believe still that Severus can turn his life around, and I believe that all the ingredients for that change are now here at Hogwarts. He knows what's at stake, and I believe that he has at least looked down the road to redemption, thanks in part to our young Harry. Harry apologized for what happened. Remus asked, looking odd. I have heard rumor that the two spoke at length in private. If the rumor is to be believed, Severus was quite drunk, and I seem to recall him suffering quite a hangover a few weeks ago. I must admit that I hope by Harry coming here to Hogwarts, Severus might be able to find some peace with his past and let go of his own hatred. Wait a minute. Sirius said, holding up his hands as he rose out of his seat once again. I hope that you're not about to ask us to apologize to him. Dumbledore watched Sirius for several moments before he sighed heavily. It is not only Severus that I worry over. You Sirius, have clung just as tightly to your own hatred of Severus as he has of you. Perhaps it is not only Severus who needs to let go of their hatred. I never murdered anyone. Sirius barked and Dumbledore shook his head. Sirius, calm down. Remus said grabbing hold of Sirius' wrist and forcing him back into his seat. Sirius looked for a moment like he was going to argue, but sat down. Apologize to that. That. Sirius. Remus shouted and his friend turned his angry eyes on the werewolf. You can not honestly tell me that you do not regret how you treated Severus while we were at school. You've told me and I've seen how you've raised Harry to despise bullies. You don't have to like him. But perhaps Harry has just shown you how well you've raised him. Perhaps the student has become the teacher. Oh how very enlightened of you. Sirius said sarcastically. However, Sirius' anger had clearly melted away and he sighed. All right. I'll think about it. But I think it can wait a bit. Very good. Dumbledore said, rising from his seat. Now, if you'll excuse me, I do need to begin preparations for the Yule Ball. We're in talks to have the Weird Sisters as the band. It should give the students quite a thrill, I think. After a few promises to talk again soon, and that they would be able to see Harry again any weekend they wished, Remus and Sirius left the castle for their home in the village. Harry walked out of the hospital wing with Tracy Davis at his side. He was finally allowed to rejoin the students nearly a week after the first task. 
Harry was extremely happy to finally being able to leave Madame Pompre's care. He'd only been awake for two days of his stay, but found the matron to be a bit overbearing. It hadn't been all bad. Hermione, Neville, Ginny, Cedric, and Cho, Hannah, Susan, Luna, Mandy, Sug, Padma and Tracy had all come to look in on him, each giving a different perspective on the first task. Well, everyone except Tracy who'd come to apologize for losing her head and shouting at him the day before the task. She had clearly convinced herself that she was responsible for Harry's exhaustion. Tracy had been with him most of the time he'd been awake. Harry thought she would have skipped classes to stay with him a bit longer if Madame Pomfrey hadn't hovered as much as she did. The two teens had really enjoyed the time they spent together, and Tracy was just as sweet and easygoing as Harry had remembered her being before their first date. Harry did notice however, that Tracy got a bit tense when any other girl came to visit with him, and barely spoke while anyone else was present. Still it was nice and as he headed down to the great hall for his first dinner out of the hospital wing, Tracy was chattering up a storm, keeping Harry smiling. Harry got a bit of a surprise when he entered the great hall. Just as he and Tracy were about to find seats along the Slytherin table, a thin girl with sleek shining silvery blonde hair stepped in front of him. Bonjour, Harry Potter. Gabrielle Delacour smiled sweetly. Uh. Bon Jour. Gabrielle, right. We. Oui. It is very good to see you out and about once again. How are you feeling? She asked sweetly, looking into his eyes intently. Harry felt as if she was trying to hypnotize him or something, but all she seemed to be doing was angering Tracy. I'm good. Actually I don't think I've ever felt better. Forgive me. This is my friend Tracy Davis. Harry smile introducing the two girls. Harry wasn't sure, but he thought Tracy looked as if she was forcing her smile. Bon Jour. Gabrielle smiled offering a friendly hand, which Tracy took. I wished to visit you before, but my sister thought it was improper, as we are not friends. It is something I wish to remedy, if you are not opposed. No. Harry smiled. I don't believe you can have too many friends. May I join you? Gabrielle asked. Harry looked at Tracy who was very clearly forcing her smile now. Harry sighed inwardly. I would like that very much, however, I did promise to spend a bit of time with Tracy. Perhaps we could have breakfast or lunch tomorrow. We... Trace bien. Gabrielle smiled brightly and with two quick kisses to each of Harry's cheeks, Gabrielle returned to the Ravenclaw table. Harry watched her go and sit next to her sister Fleur. Shall we get something to eat? Tracy asked, though most of her good mood was gone. Harry followed the auburn-haired girl and they sat next to Daphne and Blaise Zavani, who were enjoying their meal and discussing the latest charms assignment. So, Harry. Back from the dead. Blaze said. So to speak. Harry smiled. You put on one hell of a show. I don't think many seventh years could have done what you did. Daphne remarked. It was basic transfiguration. Harry looked confused. Sure, the chains, but the way you controlled them and then the metal bars. Blaze said then gave an impressed whistle. I can't even imagine the power you must have used to fight against that dragon. No wonder you passed out when it was over. Yes, we're all impressed by Harry's power. Tracy remarked. Everyone's really impressed with Harry Potter. Oh no. Daphne muttered. Blaze rolled his eyes, setting his fork down as if he were preparing to run from the table. Okay. Harry said turning to Tracy. He was doing his best to keep his voice even and not get angry, but Tracy's sudden mood swing was going to get irritating. Not even five minutes ago, you were in a great mood. 
What did I do? How about flirting with that French trollop? Tracy said scathingly. Flirting. Harry looked surprised. How was I flirting? She wants to be my friend. They all want to be your friend, Harry. Tracy said sweeping her arm around the hall. But that's not what I'm upset over. It's that you made a date with another girl while you were with me. I didn't make a date. Harry said quickly, now looking incredibly confused. I said I'd have breakfast with her. I didn't say hey let's go to the village and make out until our lips fall off. Dot. You may as well have. Tracy snapped. Let's not forget how you stared at the girls who came to visit you in the hospital wing. Like a starving man staring at a buffet. What are you talking about? Harry asked, though he wasn't even sure if he wanted to know. You're talking like a crazy person. Oh boy. Daphne said from Tracy's side, her hand going to her face in apprehension. Harry looked at her then back to Tracy who looked ready to smack him. So now I'm crazy. She said in a low, dangerous tone. You know what Potter? I don't think I want to be around you anymore. At this she got up and stormed out of the great hall, leaving a very bewildered Harry in her wake. Did we just break up? Harry asked, turning to Daphne, who was nodding. But, we weren't even a couple. She got it in her head that when you accepted her apology that it was just a formality. Daphne sighed. I tried to make her see that you weren't together and that if she really wanted to be with you, she should ask you, but. Like I said, proud and stubborn. Oi. Harry said leaning forward and rubbing his temples. Any chance I can fix this? Do you want to be her boyfriend? Daphne asked and Harry looked at her with confusion. I don't know. He sighed with annoyance. Well, unless you do, I'd just leave it alone. I'd never tell her this, but she's rather high maintenance, and she'll need a boy who's so devoted to her, he worships the very ground she stands on. Daphne said a bit sadly. Someone who's much less independent than you are. Harry nodded and with Blaze's help, they managed to change the subject and finish dinner. When it dinner was over, Harry went straight back to his room where the golden egg waited for him. Harry took the heavy gold object and sat on the couch in front of the fireplace to examine it. He had been told that the egg contained the clue for the next task, and Harry still had almost two and a half months to figure it out. He knew he'd need every minute of that time to prepare, he was certain. Harry took hold of the latch at the top of the egg and twisted. The panels fell open and an ear-splitting shriek echoed in his room. Harry slammed the panels shut and stared at the egg horrified. How is that a clue? Harry asked of the egg. He twisted the latch and went to his trunk and got quill and parchment and went back to the egg. He opened it again and listened to it as long as he could before slamming it close again. He began making a list of what the sound could possibly be. Banshee, harpies, sirens. Harry said as he wrote. As he looked at his pitiful list, Harry thought that it wasn't much to go on. It seemed a truly weak clue. Just a strange glass-shattering shriek. How were any of them supposed to figure out what it was they were supposed to do next? Maybe Cedric has an idea. Harry said, making sure the latch was tight on the egg as he set it on the mantel. He then turned his attention onto his homework, it had pilled up quite a bit while he'd been in the hospital wing. Four hours later and still feeling very overwhelmed, Harry decided it might be a good idea to get a bit of help from his friends to catch up. Still feeling very tired from the first task, Harry changed and got into bed falling asleep almost at once. Harry only had three days of classes before the weekend came, and Harry welcomed it. Thanks to some of his friends, Hermione, Susan, Mandy, and Hannah specifically, Harry had managed to catch up with all his homework, 
though he still felt behind. Tracy hadn't spoken to him since he'd been released, and Harry chose to follow Daphne's advice and let the girl be. He felt sad that things had become so strained, but he reminded himself that he'd done nothing wrong. Though he was sure that Remus and Sirius were going to harass him a bit about it all. It wasn't a Hogsmeade weekend, but as Harry was not officially a part of the Hogwarts student body, he was allowed to go to the village and visit with Sirius and Remus. He was up very early and once he was showered and dressed, he made for the village, the golden egg stuffed into his backpack. Neither Harry nor Cedric had managed to crack the egg's clue. And Harry was hopeful that Remus or Sirius would be able to guide him in the right direction if not just tell him flat out what he was going to be facing. Harry shivered in the cold, but smiled as he cast a glance over his shoulder to take in the sight of Hogwarts Castle. The first snow had fallen and Harry couldn't help think how amazing the grounds looked covered in a blanket of snow. He arrived in the village and noticed at once how empty it looked without loads of Hogwarts students roaming the streets. Harry thought that if he had time, he'd stop by the sweets shop and get a few thank you gifts for the girls who'd helped him catch up on his work this week. They had all promised to ease up on him during the weekend, especially now that he was caught up, though Hermione hinted that she'd like him to continue working hard during the week. Neville had mentioned that Hermione was really driven in her schoolwork, and had a habit of encouraging her friends to work just as hard as she did. Harry arrived at the small cottage where his godfather had taken up residence and was greeted by a beaming Sirius, who pulled him into the house. You're looking much better. Rima smiled as Harry sat down at the table. The sensuous aroma of sausages cooking made Harry smile a bit. I'm feeling loads better. I know you said magic was like your muscles, Sirius. You got to work them to make them stronger. Sirius smiled as he leaned against a counter, his arms folded. I feel like I can do anything right now. I've even had an easier time with some of my spell work. Harry said, looking proudly at his godfather. Well, next time don't overdo it. Magical exhaustion is a very serious thing, Harry. Some wizards have never fully recover, and can actually lose their magic. You have to be more careful. Are you caught up on your school work? Remus asked setting a platter of toast on the table, which Harry immediately fell upon. Yeah. Hermione really pushed me hard over the last couple of days, and I was able to get caught up. Hermione. Sirius smiled, looking to Remus. Was she the redhead? No, that was Susan Bones. The one who had you blushing like an idiot most of the time. Remus smirked. Sirius threw his head back and laughed as Remus went on. Susan and Hannah always came together. Though I can see how you'd get confused. Hermione usually had Ginny Weasley with her, and she's a redhead as well. So which one was Hermione? The really shy one who barely ever spoke and just stared at Harry while he slept. Wrong again. Remus smirked. That was Mandy. And, just so you don't screw up again, Luna was the one with the long blonde hair and the big silver blue eyes. Hermione was the one with the really curly hair. Right, the one who kept asking us questions like we were living encyclopedias. Scary smart that one. You had so many girls coming to look in on you, it was hard to keep track. Sirius shrugged, finally taking a seat once he'd finished making his tea. But five girls came every day, every moment they could spare. Who was it? Harry asked curiously. No one's mentioned visiting me. Huh. Sirius looked puzzled. Well, Hermione was there. Actually, I think she and Susan were there the most. Sometimes Hermione had that other redhead with her. Ginny. Remus remarked. Right. Sirius nodded. Susan was there nearly as much as Hermione, usually with that feisty little blonde. 
Hannah. Remus smiled dishing up eggs to everyone. I think those two fancy you. Hermione and Susan, that is. Sirius said giving Harry a sly grin. Maybe, but I think it more likely Hermione just cares about me as a friend. She doesn't have a lot of friends, or she didn't before I got there. I've helped he make a few more, I think. Harry shrugged. Don't rule her out. Sirius said, pointing his fork at Harry. Sometimes great romances come out of great friendships. I'll keep it in mind. Harry rolled his eyes. Is there any girls who've caught your eye? Last we talked you were taking out a... Remus looked to Sirius for help, but the man just mirrored Remus' puzzlement and shrugged. Tracy. We broke up a few nights ago. At least I think we did. It's all really strange. Do you want to talk about it? Sirius asked with concern, noticing the strange look on Harry's face. Harry launched into the full story, explaining how Tracy had accosted him the day before the tournament, and how she had apologized the day he was released from the hospital wing. And how they had gone to dinner and met Gabrielle. Then she just starts yelling at me, and breaks up with me. But the thing is, we weren't even dating. Harry finished looking pleadingly at his godfather and uncle. Obviously she thought you were, or that you should have been. Remus commented. That's what her friend told me after Tracy stomped out of the great hall. Harry said, sinking in his chair a bit. I'm not even sure I want a girlfriend. I mean, I haven't even decided if I'm going to stay at Hogwarts after this year. I mean, I love it and everything, but I have all my friends at Salem and everything. And Stacy. Sirius quipped, making Harry turn an evil eye to his godfather who was very interested in the bit of sausage on his fork. The point being, I don't want to end up hurting someone if I decide not to stay. I mean, yeah, I'd like to go on dates, but to commit myself to someone when I'm not even sure what's going to happen. Harry, Remus said placatingly as he looked at the boy who so reminded him of his long-lost best friend. While it's noble of you to be so concerned for other people's feelings, you are cheating yourself out of something that could be very nice. There is no law written that says that whomever you date will be the one for you for the rest of your life. And one or two dates isn't going to tell you everything you need to know about someone either. The thing is, Sirius said, setting his fork down. People act differently when they first begin dating. It takes a while for you to get comfortable with the other person before you truly let your guard down and all your ugly secrets come out. If a girl still loves you after she hears you singing Backstreet Boys songs in the shower. Oh, one time. Harry rolled his eyes. I told you it got stuck in my head. Why can't you let it go? And she still loves you, that's a girl who you might want to have the rest of your life. Sirius finished trying not to laugh at Harry's indignation. Got it? So you're both saying I should get a girlfriend? Harry asked, but both men shook their heads. All we're saying is to do what feels right to you. Sirius said pointedly. Harry smiled weakly and they continued eating, talking of inconsequential topics until the meal was finished. Sirius asked if Harry had had any more nightmares. No. Harry shook his head. But my scar twinges every now and again. It feels like someone's putting a really hot knife to my forehead. But then it goes away and I'm fine. Sirius looked worried, but he said nothing. If you have any more nightmares, go see Dumbledore right away. Do your best to remember everything, write it down if you have to, but go and see the headmaster. Remus said. He's very interested in these dreams. Are they important? Harry asked, now sounding concerned. We don't know, but they could be. Dumbledore wouldn't tell us, but we think that you might not be having dreams at all, 
but actually witnessing events as they happen. Sirius explained. Harry nodded his understanding. Once again the topics turned and jokes were made. Harry really enjoyed spending time with his godfather, especially now with the added bonus of having Remus. Serious stories became even better with the second, more honest opinion added to them. At last, Remus broached the topic of the second task, which lead to Harry removing the golden egg from his bag, and opening it for them to listen to. It didn't take long before Sirius reached out to close the shrieking object. See, not a lot to go on. Harry sighed heavily. Every time I open it, I'm afraid I'm going to rupture my eardrums. I think it might be Sirens, or a banshee. Actually Harry. Remus said, folding his hands. What's interesting about our world is how one creature's language sounds very different outside of its normal environment. I don't follow. Harry replied. Think about it Harry. Sirius said catching on to what Remus was saying. How many different, truly different types of habitats are there in this world? Hundreds. Harry answered at once, still looking puzzled. While that is technically true, Remus smiled. Most of them have something in common. Can you figure out what that is? Harry hated this. He wanted an answer and he was feeling like he was in class again. Harry looked at both men who were smiling back at him and knew they weren't going to get a straight answer. So, he thought about it. Jungles, mountains, caves, deserts. What did they all have in common? I don't know. Harry said out loud, still thinking. Come on Harry. Sirius said. What is it that every single creature in the world needs to survive? That's easy, air. Harry looked puzzled, and then he sat up suddenly. Whatever this thing is, it doesn't need air. At least not air like we breathe. Harry shouted triumphantly. Very good. Remus applauded while Sirius beamed. Whatever it is lives in the lake, right? Harry asked and both men beamed. So in order to hear the clue, the egg needs to be underwater. I think he's got it. Sirius grinned and reached out to pat his godson's shoulder. Now that the hard part is over, you still have a big decision to make. Who are you going to ask to the Yule Ball? The what? Harry's eyes got as round as dinner plates and Sirius looked to Remus who was shaking his head. I thought they'd have announced it already. Sirius looked like he'd just been caught stealing cookies. Whoops. Well done Sirius. Sirius and Remus made Harry swear not to speak of the ball to anyone until it was announced. That turned out to be quite easy as at dinner that night, Dumbledore stood before the students and made the formal announcement. All around him, Harry saw girls bending close and whispering. Harry couldn't say why, but he suddenly felt like he had a target on his back. He realized that Sirius had been right, and that it would be a good idea to ask someone right away to avoid a lot of awkwardness and hurt feelings later on. The problem was, Harry didn't know who to ask. Tracy was out of the question. She wasn't even talking to him anymore. Harry thought for a moment about Hannah, but quickly decided that the Yule Ball would be a perfect opportunity for Neville to man up and finally ask the her out. Harry was torn from his musings by the sound of giggling to his left. Harry turned and saw some third-year Hufflepuffs looking at him. He decided that it would be a good idea to get away as fast as he could. Bidding goodbye to his friends, and noticing the disappointed looks on Hannah, Susan, and Megan's faces. Harry scurried out of the Great Hall as fast as he could without looking like he was running for his life. Harry went to his room and gathered his homework. He thought he might be able to get some work done and maybe he could figure out the answer to the problem of who to ask to the ball. As he headed back out and towards the library, he passed to groups of girls, who all stared at him as he passed, 
making him feel like he was a rabbit prancing in front of packs of starving wolves. Oh sure, I can face a dragon, but a few girls look at you and you're the goddamned cowardly lion. Harry berated himself. So lost in his thoughts about which girl he was going to ask to the ball, that he wasn't paying any attention to where he was going. That was why he found himself on his butt staring up at Victor Crumb. I am sorry. Victor said offering a hand to Harry. Actually I am very glad to be seeing you. Yeah. Harry asked a bit surprised. Yes. I've asked Von Dring if you could help me. Your friend. The girl. Harry cocked his head and smiled. You need to be a bit more specific. Harry said with a bit of a laugh. I suppose. I see you with many girls. But I am talking about the one who usually joins you in the library. The girl with the very curly hair. Hermione. Harry asked and Victor smiled. The girl with the really bushy crazy hair. Yes this is her. Victor nodded. She has a very pretty smile. I have been coming to the library trying to talk to her, but she is always with that redhead girl, or with you. Do you want me to introduce you? Harry asked, and knew at once this was what Victor was trying to ask. I'd be happy to, but, just so you know, I'm sure you could do it on your own. I mean, you're famous and all. Victor nodded but Harry saw that he didn't want to use his fame to get close to Harry's friend. I've seen you and the Hogwarts in the mornings. Victor said, changing the subject as he turned and followed Harry into the library. I wonder if I may join you some mornings. Running is a very good way to keep in shape, and I feel like I am vasting away here. I have not been on my broom in months. I know exactly what you mean. Harry said as they took a seat. I really miss being in the air. You play Quidditch then? Oh yeah, and racing. Harry nodded. I prefer the racing. I have heard of broom racing, though I have not been fortunate to witness a race myself. I was hopeful that I might go to America this summer to see one. Victor said and Harry smiled. Why do that when you could be a part of one right here? Harry smiled. I haven't talked to the guys since before the first task, but we were trying to put together a race right here at Hogwarts. You're absolutely welcome to join us as soon as we get it all figured out. Victor agreed and the two champions began talking about what had happened in the first task. Harry hadn't seen Victor but enjoyed listening to his tale. It wasn't long however before someone joined them. There you are Harry. Hermione smiled as she approached the table, a small smile on her face. She noticed who he was sitting with and looked oddly at Harry. Hermione Granger, Victor Crumb. Harry said, and Victor rose from his seat and bowed to Hermione who blushed. It got worse when Victor took her hand and kissed it. It's very nice to meet you. Hermione smiled though her voice was really shaky. She hesitantly took the seat Victor offered. So what were you two discussing? Broom racing. Victor said, stammering a bit. Harry thought it was a bit odd that someone like Victor who was extremely famous would be shy around someone like Hermione. Excuse me for a moment, I really need to find a book. Harry said as he rose from his seat. He didn't know why, but he suddenly felt the urge to leave Crumb and Hermione alone together. He disappeared into the stacks but found a spot where he could see them. They sat silently for a few minutes, and Harry wondered why Crumb should be so shy. He could understand Hermione, but Victor was very famous, known throughout the world. He was the youngest professional Quidditch player, and one of the very best seekers in the world. Surely he had girls flinging themselves at him. And then it struck him. Maybe that's why Victor liked Hermione. She didn't care about Quidditch. 
he'd seen her eyes glass over whenever he and Neville brought up the topic. Like Harry, perhaps Victor didn't care about his fame and wanted someone who liked him for who he was, not his fame. Harry was just about to return to the table and see if he could help them start a conversation, when Hermione suddenly turned and asked Victor a question. They began to talk, and Harry could actually see Crum relax. Hum Crum and Hermione. A sweet dreamy voice came from behind Harry. He turned and smiled as he saw Luna love good looking through the stacks at the two. They'd have very adorable babies. Harry choked on his laughter and shook his head at Luna. I think it's a little soon to plan a wedding. They just got introduced. I hope he snogs her silly. Hermione really needs a good release. I've told her that she should masturbate more. Harry felt his face burn with mortification. I am sometimes she can even function properly with all those snizzle groves around her head all the time. Snizzle what's? Harry asked, trying not to fall over with laughter. Snizzle groves. They're a lot like fruit flies, though they're invisible. Constantly buzzing in your ears and breaking your concentration. The only way to deal with them is to have at least one orgasm a day. I've never seen anyone so infested with them before. I'll make sure and let her know. Harry grinned trying to keep from roaring out with laughter. So, who are you going to ask to the Yule Ball, Harry? Luna asked with her normal dreamy smile. I hope it's not me. I'd hate to turn you down and hurt your feelings. You don't want to go to the ball with me? Harry asked a bit surprised. It's not that you're not attractive, and you're a very pleasant kisser, but I am hoping that someone else will ask me. I like him very much, and I'm sure he likes me as well, though he may not have figured it out just yet. He can be very slow sometimes. Ooh. Harry asked very curious now. Ron Weasley. His sister Ginny and I used to be very close friends when we were little, but after my mother died, I kind of withdrew, and we lost that closeness. But I used to go play at her house all the time, and I always thought Ron was very sweet. He's changed since coming to school, but I think it's a phase. One day very soon, he's going to understand that no one likes the person he is now, and he'll go back to the sweet boy who used to kiss my knee when I fell down. Luna smiled. Her eyes distant now as she was remembering a time long ago. I wouldn't hold my breath. Harry said sadly. Besides, you can do much better than Ron Weasley. Perhaps. But my mother always says that the heart wants what the heart wants. Harry nodded at her wise words. Look, just promise me that you won't wait for him forever. You're very pretty and a truly amazing person Luna. If you find someone who treats you right, don't let him get away. I promise, Harry. But what about you? So many witches wishing to be on your arm. Who will you choose? Luna asked, her eyes focusing on Harry's. To be honest, I really don't know. I'm sure you will pick the most suitable partner, though I am sure you will have a very full dance card. Luna said, with a sudden smile. Harry couldn't help but smile in return. He knew she was right. Do you have any suggestions? Harry asked, but Luna simply shook her head. I wouldn't presume to suggest anyone, as I don't know exactly what you look for in a girl, and having no experience with girls myself. That's okay, Luna. Harry smirked holding up his hands. Part of him wanted her to finish her statement, but only a very small part. Luna simply smiled and Harry shook his head. Luna gave a little wave and bade Harry a good evening, leaving the boy smirking at her retreating form. He really liked Luna, she was always so interesting to talk to even though she didn't seem to have any sort of mental filter and just said whatever came to her mind. Still. 
Harry turned back to see how Victor and Hermione were doing, and was shocked to see they were both gone. Harry wondered if they had left together. Deciding he was not going to get any work done. Harry gathered his bag and headed back to his room where he ended up staring at the egg for an hour before he decided to see if what Remus and Sirius had told him would work. Harry was disappointed that he only had a shower in his room, and the sink wasn't big enough to completely submerse the egg. It was too late to go and find Dumbledore to see if the castle had some place to go where he could get the egg and his head underwater. So, placing the egg back on the mantelpiece, Harry vowed to seek out the headmaster first thing in the morning. The sooner he heard the clue, the sooner he could figure out what he had to do in the next task. Please like and subscribe.